Now, um, I'll just tell you another little story here, okay? This was about um, Marduk, who was uh, an important king in the area, and his grandmother, this is Marduk, and his, this is his grandmother. She's a dragon. Some, some, some people aren't that easy to get along with. <laughs> On the other hand, he's not treating his grandma very well. So you've got some real problem. Her name is Tiamat. And uh, he, he had a son who was named Eu. I'm sorry, that isn't Marduk, that's Eu. Um, who became king uh, of the gods after defeating Tiamat the dragon and dividing her body into two parts, the sky and the earth, and then he killed off all the other gods and made people from their blood. So you had a brand new shiny society uh, with nobody to argue with them because he pretty much got rid of everybody. Um, however, since they were not really real, it doesn't matter all that much. <laughs> I mean, sounds like somebody's bad dream. Well, <laughs> who invented these stories? It's got to be like one or two people. No, I think you have to think about what and the I society evolve, was like. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. Somebody's got to have made it up to start with. Oh, well, absolutely. I really don't think his grandmother was a dragon, but you know, I'm a skeptic. So what can you say? Um, th yeah, they they had to come up with stories based on the things that existed around them. And as I say, they didn't have any biology courses, they didn't have any history courses, so really they had to just look around at what was going on around them, and this was the kind of thing that they saw around them. A lot of killing and taking over control on the basis of that. And well, I guess, I guess you'd go kill everybody and then make up a story to cover yourself. So. You've got it. That's exactly right, Lucy. Okay, now we're starting to get to people that we perhaps know a little better. So, as early as 4000 BCE, there were early Greek caves that showed evidence of goddess, wor goddess worship at the town of Delphi. Um, Delphi was um, north and, now I'm looking, I'm looking north, okay? So it's north and a little bit to the west of the current city of um, Athens. Um, and of course, you've probably all heard of the oracle at Delphi. Um, it's very interesting because they've done some studies on that recently. And um, the oracle was um, supposed to, supposedly in a chamber below. Uh, there were goddesses, I'm not I'm sorry, uh, priestesses who handled the uh, visitors who came to Delphi to get answers to their questions. So, you know, am I going to have a boy or a girl? Um, is my husband going to be faithful to me? Um, do you think we're going to make a lot of money on the grapes this year? You know, that kind of thing. So they'd go off and they'd, they'd pay some, some money to the goddess and she would sit over this, this opening in the earth and there, this steam would come up out of it and she would have a vision. Well now, just recently I remember reading in the newspaper a while back that they had done some testing on the steam that's coming out of this vent. Did you see that too? Yeah, and she was probably having a really good trip. <laughs> when she gave up with no, there were there were a lot of chemicals apparently in it that made it very difficult for. I mean, you couldn't breathe that stuff for a long time. But Delphi was a very strong center of the goddess religion because the goddess religion existed in in Greece as well as the others. It's just that it you know as as it expanded into the sky gods it. It declined in value, but um, certainly Delphi was very, very important. So the other thing that the Greeks did that was important or um, a step forward is uh, when they moved away from Gaia worship, they started looking at all kinds of gods who had responsibilities for this and that and the other thing, and they created um, a strong pantheon. So we'll look at the Greek pantheon. I gave you a copy of this in your handouts. <coughs> Now, this one is going to stand for the Greek, the Roman, the Norse, the Celtic. They're all the same. You know, they've got different names and they've got different relationships. But when the Greeks got it right, all the other cult cultures that were uh, in place after that said, well, we should have a pantheon of our gods. And it ended up looking very similar. They had people in charge of war and people in charge of peace and people in charge of marriage and on and on and on. And so, Rather than spend the rest of the whole program here talking about the different ones, we're going to talk about Greece, and then if you want to do more research on it, I, I think that would be wonderful, but I think you'll find that the other ones are very much the same. 
Okay, so this is where we're heading, and we're going to get to the sky gods as we get to to this part of the world. So we're we're looking at the Middle East. Here's Egypt, and that is one of the major societies with very strong mythology that we'll be talking about. You'll notice that Egypt is built on the River Nile, and I'm sure you've come across that. And there's a very good description here, or a depictation here, of the, the delta of the Nile. The delta, the Nile was a river that was, fled by, uh, was fed by Lake Victoria in the middle of Africa. And so <coughs> all this water would run down here, and in the springtime, when there was a lot of rain and a lot of water, it would flood. And so the Nile flood would flood constantly. And when it hit the end of this period, it broke into a, a, th this part of the river. It would break into a whole bunch of different uh, little rivers, and it, forming a delta and <coughs> fanning out. And as a result, this was one of the most fertile areas in the world. The, uh, because it was it constantly flooded every year and regenerated the the soil uh, with the with the um, uh, floodwaters that went uh, and and the uh, silt that it carried went all over the land and kept the, the the land very fertile so this was great agricultural land in here one of the best places in the world um, for um, for the growth of agriculture and at the same time, we had another society up here in Mesopotamia. And these rivers don't show nearly as well as, as the Nile, but I'll show you where they are. Um, we have the Tigris coming down on this side and coming into this delta. And on this side, we have the Euphrates River. And these two rivers join here and create a very similar system going into the Persian Gulf as the Nile emptying into the Mediterranean Sea. So we had two extremely fertile areas. And as these, these um, warriors, um, riding warriors, the Aryans came down from this uh, area uh, above the Black Sea, they headed in here and they began to build societies all around here. Not in Egypt. Egypt was already taken over by the native people, but they built all kinds of societies in here. Uh, the main ones that we're going to look at is Assur, which was the head of the Assyrian Empire. It was the first empire there. And Sumer, um, which also had a bunch of uh, satellite cities, one of which was Babylon. Um, and all of these places were uh, built very rich societies. Now up to now, what we've been looking at is societies of nomads, right? We've pretty much been looking at nomads. I don't think we've been looking at settled societies anywhere. Now we're going to start to move into the area of settled societies. And the settled societies aren't going to be ruled by a goddess. Oh no, no we have to have a sky god. So we're going to start moving into the focus on the warrior society and, and the male-dominated society as we move on. So what happened to the great goddess before the, uh, as the sky gods moved in? Well, the Hera and Juno, Hera in um, Greek and Juno in Roman mythology, pretty much became a nagging wife. And if you read any of the myths around um, Hera and Juno, and I, they, you know, they're, uh, let's just treat them as one. We'll just, just go with Hera, okay? They are the same person with a different name. They were married to the king of the gods, and you know he saw no reason why he had to stay at home. He was a very difficult guy to have around. So he was constantly uh, having children by different um, gods or go uh, different goddesses or by humans. He was actually going so far as to do that. And Hera, uh, Juno or Hera spent most of their time uh, trying to get back at his partners. There's no point trying to get back at the sky god. He was way too powerful. But they would uh, go on and uh, like she, uh, turned one of, one of the women was turned into um, uh, a beautiful calf. And so it wasn't an ugly calf, but she was still a cow. <laughs> no matter how you look at it. These stories sound like they're very recent. Don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Things haven't changed that much, have they? And on and on it goes. So Artemis, who is the goddess, the Greek goddess of hunting, um, she was um, 
a virgin goddess and she she really wasn't much interested in guys at all uh, but she did like the hunt and um, in she she had this fertility kind of effect because remember we're talking about the early societies were hunter gatherers so so far we've looked at Demeter and Persephone who are the gathering sites the growth of the of the plants and she represented the hunting side so uh, but in at this point in time she became very masculinized and all, all of a sudden she didn't have any friends or any boyfriends and um, she was not looked on kindly for her behavior of going out and hunting um, and uh, and as I say she was seen as only a virgin goddess because if she was going to act like a guy she sure as heck couldn't um, be treated like a woman so the the whole mythology changed in their approach to these women as as the societies developed into the sky god uh, concept and so the question I put in here what would cause the decline of the goddess myth well I think we've got the answer um, the societies just changed their whole aspect of looking at life. They were no longer hunter-gatherers, they were now living in cities and they were, you know, headed by warriors and whatever. They had moved into the modern world.